In Black Holes, A Brief History of Time, M. Norbisi Philip gives us a number of rearticulated, refigured cosmic definitions of the universe. Philip writes, Space-time, the four-dimensional space whose points are events. You cannot talk about space as it relates to black people, to African people, without talking about movement or moving through space. And once you talk about moving through space as it relates to Africans, then you must confront the forces that prohibit or restrict that moving. This is a piece concerned with the matter and movement of blackness on and of Earth. I am particularly concerned here with lines of flight, how travel through space and time is made possible in the face of the prohibition and foreclosure which attends so closely, so stiflingly to the condition of blackness. This would seem to be an impossibility, but as with so much in our universe, quantum entanglement is spooky and surprising. One can be talking about flight, about black flight, taking off whilst necessarily being tethered to the ground. The drawings you will see have been made with graphite, a commonplace quite everyday mineral hewn from the earth in giant holes carved open by hand. It is ground, chipped and then sluiced right out, it is bored out of the underground tunnels too, the darkness of the mine shaft cut through by the enigmatic luster of the mineral. In lumps, deposits, disseminated flakes, amorphous bodies and veins, it glimmers down there, all black and blue with a chorus of flashing frayed threads of silver, grasping, holding and revelling in any hint of light. Torch, headlamp, camera flash. Graphite is entirely composed of carbon, in rings of six atoms bound by covalent bonds and layered in horizontal sheets, to be precise, which, under the right conditions of atomic transmogrification, will turn to diamond. Yusuf Komunyaka writes that pressure can make everything whole again, but I am categorically not interested in such clear crystalline distractions here, so prized for their rarity, transparency, durability and completeness. In fact, Graphite fails in almost all of the qualities in which value is ascribed to the stuff of the earth. It is a tricky, slippery, greasy substance which resists the pressures and fallacies of finitude as a condition of its very being. Graphite's horizontal layers of tightly held atoms are conversely, in the vertical direction, very loosely joined together by the weakest of chemical bonds, caused by shifting electron density, a consequence of quantum dynamics. Such interatomic instability means that graphite slakes off, leaving traces of encounter with everything it comes into contact with. It is a material always automatically giving of itself. So counter the belt-tightening, profit-driven logics of extraction, and in so doing, it disquiets almost all of the tools available to us. Clagging and coating equipment, and resisting desires for purity by stubbornly clinging to less valuable matter. When working with graphite, you should really wear a mask and gloves, as, in its generosity, it gets everywhere. It is inhaled, ingested and absorbed. It becomes a part of you. And as one commenter on the Deviant Art message board says, you really don't want to get black lung just because you huffed a bunch of pencil dust. In fact, graphite has almost always been a part of us, as long as there has been an us to speak of at all. Graphite is one of about a dozen minerals found in the interstellar grains of the earliest meteorites we have encountered. The cosmic primordial soup birthed in the Big Bang was formed of three ingredients, hydrogen, helium and lithium, and it was only much later in the belching and burping byproducts of an insatiable consumption of these elements, so-called nuclear fusion in stars, that carbon and oxygen would form taking mineral form in molecular clouds of diamonds, graphites, oxides, carbides, nitrates and silicates. Graphite fails in almost all of the qualities in which value is ascribed to the stuff of the earth, and yet it is the only non-metal which can conduct electricity. Here it comes into its own, as a conduit and as a lubricant too, greasing the wheels for the movement, connectivity and conductivity of energy the black best friend, the best supporting actress, the sidekick with enormous range alongside those rarer, shinier Earths. But what about what graphite receives? The Ohio Carbon Bank blog tells us that US military and nuclear energy plants use graphite for electromagnetic wave absorption, 
and that a lesser-known property of graphite is its unique ability to absorb fast-moving particles, protons and neutrons. This interesting property allows the material to absorb light, radio waves, microwaves and radiation too. This makes it a candidate for all sorts of magic, capable of absorbing radar and so evading capture, an invisibility cloak no less, and an alchemical substance which can absorb sound and return heat in its place, to name a few. Perhaps this should all be unsurprising. After all, here is a mineral in constant dialogue with the very beginnings of the cosmos, and without which the universe as we know it would simply not exist. Here is a mineral synonymous with grease and dust, and yet, in the act of simply making a mark, the superimposition of sloughed-off layers of conductive matter on the page are tuned to the spectral frequency of the electromagnetic cosmic echo. Here is a pre-solar mineral, a medium which holds the memory of the longest now, both science and seance, a conduit and a conjurer. The American photographer, Attila von Salle, was perhaps acutely aware of the importance of finding the right medium in his attempts to photograph ghosts. In the end, he turned to sound recordings to more fully capture the phenomena. After years of experimentation, he found reel-to-reel -reel tape to be the most successful, reporting hearing the voices of spirits on playing back recordings made when no one else was around. These messages were intimate, comic and charming, like scrawls on a cosmic bathroom wall, except instead of reminding us that someone was here, rather they call us to remember that they still are. This is G, Hot Dog Arts. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you all. Von Salle's experiments have since become the stuff of ridicule. But perhaps people laugh and point in order to preclude a meaningful engagement with the real potential of this work. The possibility that cosmic latecomers such as ourselves might just be able to engage with the frequencies which created the conditions of life and life gone by. In so doing, this requires us to fundamentally reconsider the way in which we create and celebrate value from the stuff of the earth and where we position ourselves in the space-time continuum too. In 2019, I conducted some investigations of my own, similarly between the heavens, the ground and into the earth, navigating Lusaka's illustrious and in parts overgrown Leopards Hill Cemetery, accompanied by good friend, taxi driver and research collaborator Paul Mumbi. We were following a team of grave diggers, armed with spades and grass cutters working to negotiate the paradoxical abundance of life bursting from the ground, in search of the burial site of the pioneer of Zambia's independence-era space programme, Director General Edward Festus Mukuka Nkoloso. Through the space programme, Nkoloso constructed a rigorous and inventive course of training, which included performance, physical exercise, simulations of anti-gravity and class-based study, the program was equipped with a spacecraft and a team of specially trained astronauts and led by a black woman, Martha Mwamba, and her deputy, Godfrey Mwango. And footage and accounts of the cadets show that engagement in Colossus' program was taken very seriously. That this space program was unfolding against the backdrop of Zambian independence is pertinent. As Namwali Serpel has written about beautifully, and Colossal's work throughout his life was closely associated with an active struggle for the emancipation of black people in the region from British colonial control. Alongside the space programme, in seeking to make the break from colonialism, the newly independent Zambian government undertook a series of economic and social reforms that would radically restructure relations between people, property and the earth. Through the abolition of private property and the nationalisation of the mines, the country's land and minerals were no longer matter for generating profit, but rather matter that had the means to enrich the lives and futures of the Zambian population. Towards the same ends, the concurrent Zambian space programme required of black Zambians to craft a narrative in which black people were themselves no longer seen as resources, as minerals, and were not only free to flourish on earth, but could aspire to even greater heights too. That this group of Zambian astronauts never made it into orbit is neither here nor there. This was a project that was not solely concerned with leaving the Earth, nor was it preoccupied with a future emancipation. 
Arguably, in conceiving of and constructing the programme the journey Colossal sought to undertake was already successful. Fittingly, the motto of the programme is given in the present indefinite tense. Wherever fate and human glory are found, we are always there. This emancipation is ubiquitous, occurring wherever. It has occurred and will continue unceasingly into the future. The Zambian astronauts are already always there. What follows is an incomplete taxonomy of flight, as observed through grainy footage of the programme, distilled from largely racist archival accounts and news reports from the time, and supported by the work of others who have engaged with the programme too particularly the writer Namwali Serple and the filmmaker Kabinda Lemba. It is channelled here in graphite, in words and in speech. The oil drums. I'm getting them acclimated to space travel by placing them in my space capsule every day, Nkoloso told the press conference. It is a 40-gallon oil drum in which they sit and I then roll them down the side of a hill. This gives them the feeling of rushing through space. The camera pans and I watch as a team waits to catch the barrel at the base of the hill. The first attempt is unsuccessful, but fortunately a second attempt brings the barrel to a halt. The astronaut emerges, smiling and triumphant. The swing. Despite Nkoloso's terrifying description, I also make them swing from the end of a long rope. When they reach the highest point, I cut the rope. This produces the feeling of freefall. The footage we have of the swings show exercises which instead appear to be hugely entertaining. There is no slicing of the rope here, and seemingly no fear of it either. I wonder if this is Martha, as she rushes towards us filling the frame. The helmets. Colossal's helmet appears to be the most advanced. Netting covers a sturdy metal bowl with a thick strap fixing it under his chin. And footage shows other astronauts wearing helmets too smartly wandering through the background of shots and secured during the most vigorous of training exercises. The books. Rummaging is not a dignified act. It implies a state of chaos, a disorderly approach to sorting through mess. One journalist at the time writes disparagingly of Colosso. Rummaging through a battered briefcase, he pulled out a space comic book. I get a lot of ideas from this, he said. So have many American and Russian scientists. Before I even encounter the book, I realise that I have been conditioned to view Nkoloso and the programme in a particular light. The space comic book can only be something to be ridiculed. Yet ITN footage shows books that look significantly more academic, with diagrams, text and photographs. I realise that perhaps yet again Colosso is one step ahead. The books here could be comic books or encyclopedias, what matters more is the work of the book as a prop, that we are seen to consult a particular form of communicating and consolidating knowledge. If the journey one seeks to undertake is epistemic, a barrel can be a space capsule, and even a comic book can hold the technology to activate it. The Director General Throughout, Nkoloso is a striking figure. When I first see him, in photographs alongside an article he has authored, he is in full military uniform with an impressive array of badges and decorations. Footage of him at the academy shows him in a crisp white shirt with a tie which flops over a billowing cape, only serving to accentuate the otherworldliness of the garment. It would be reductive to describe his appearance as merely reflective of the activities he was engaged in, and rather I find that this crafted presence was a constitutive part of his projects and their political agenda bringing together attire and influences from a range of sources and constructing an entirely new, emancipatory and emancipated being from the components. The astronauts. The astronauts appear to delight in lifting their fellow cadet from a barrel. As gruelling as it was, his silk shirt does not appear to have been damaged at all. His arms were raised so that he could be lifted out of the barrel, but now he is up, they remain lifted. Next to him, two astronauts wear smart blazers of a fabric that appears soft and with a trim that catches the light. The Standard Nkoloso holds the standard as he leads the group in a single-file circuit around the hill on which we had earlier witnessed the hair-raising barrel roll. 
When the cadets sit on the ground, legs outstretched, vigorously shaking their arms, one stands sentry at the back holding it high. As another astronaut takes his turn on the swing, the standard is again held up, the golden bird reminiscent of the new country's national symbol, the Eagle of Liberty. The Abandoned Farmhouse An interviewer casually describes the venue for the Zambian space programme as an abandoned farmhouse. But there is no footage shot inside of the house itself, and journalist accounts either describe activity which takes place outside or in other offices in the city. The abandoned farmhouse has become something of a ghost of the programme, a white presence which is never properly encountered or addressed, and secondary to the true action which appears to take place outside. On independence, a significant number of the white population left Zambia for South Africa. I wonder if this house is an artefact of white flight, its grounds repurposed for the very opposite. The Rocket The American journalist Arthur Hopp generously gives us one of the most exacting descriptions of a rocket launch. He writes, Mwango, in a khaki uniform and combat helmet, lay stiffly on the ground as the oil drum was tilted over on its side. If he felt any anxiety, then he didn't show it. Then, on Colossal's orders, Mwango's fellow astronauts, one hampered by a spear, stuffed him into the oil drum feet first. A OK, said Colossal anxiously, thumping on the seal steel side of the space capsule. A OK, came the game if muffled reply. Blast off, cried Colossal, giving the space capsule a shove with his foot. All systems go. Mwango brought the space capsule to its landing against the blue gum tree completely unassisted. Man, what a ride, he said. And Colossal nodded his head approvingly. That is what astronauts always say, he explained. The limitations of the barrel for leaving the Earth's atmosphere were never raised by Colossal or his team. And instead, the exercise is considered, in Colossal's own words, an unqualified success. Propulsion systems. There were several propulsion systems proposed for the rocket. The first, planned for Independence Day but vetoed by the authorities, comprised several cases of dynamite stacked beneath a capsule to be set alight at the peak of the ceremonies. The Mukwa and Mulolo systems which followed were developed from local technologies. The Mukwa involved a catapult system built using wood from local Mukwa trees and the Mulolo system comprised of ropes tied to tall trees from which astronauts would be swung slowly out into space. The last reported system under investigation is cryptically known as turbulent propulsion. And Colossal would only reveal the name of the system to conceal details from the Russians and Americans as a matter of national prestige. And Colossal's parting words to Hop spoke to his concerns about Russians and Americans. He said... What they can do, we can do also. At this point, the Cold War space race was underway, yet to put a person on the moon, and in this context, Colossal's words rung true. If America and Russia could work towards a moonshot, so too could Zambia. Martha Mwamba Little is known of Martha Mwamba, despite her prestigious position as the lead astronaut of the programme, destined to go to the moon and then on to Mars. And Colossal's son describes how the space programme was open to those who could complete the training, and women excelled. In footage of the programme, I have seen two women, but I cannot be sure if either is her. She captured the imagination of the American and British journalists, who described her as sister of the heavens and Zambia's number one space girl, and yet only once afforded her the opportunity to speak for herself within their articles. Godfrey Mwango. By contrast, we have photographs of Godfrey Mwango, detailed descriptions of him and even his own voice, described as Nkolossal's closest confidant and bodyguard, when Mwango asserts with a grin that I am ready for the Mars flight now, Nkolossal corrects him, this trip is Mwamba's to take. His grin vanishes, we later read. A note of foreboding in the Miami News four days after Zambian independence provide some clues of what was to come. Nkoloso is distressed. 
I have had troubles with my spaceman and spacewoman. They won't concentrate on spaceflight. There's too much lovemaking when they should be studying the moon. A year later, Mwamba was pregnant, and according to Nkoloso, had been talked out of continuing on the Zambian space program by her parents. We have been watching the supermassive black hole at the centre of the so-called dark forest of our galaxy for over 20 years. Footage of this vigil is both largely uneventful and full of action. It is characterised by a multitude of presents, an oily, fuzzy, edged blackness in which bright white dots of varying sizes hover and surge erratically, silent. Simultaneously, nothing really happens. It is something of a paradox to be watching a black hole at all. In a landscape in which sight is dependent on time travel and listening in to faint radio frequency signals, our tools, bodily and scientific, can only hint at the complexity. Here, where the force of gravity is so strong that it draws everything into an untold depth of being, there is nothing to see at all. Instead, we observe its event horizon a point of no return from which an object passing through will be sucked in. At 10 million degrees centigrade, the horizon is the black hole's hottest and brightest feature. Without it, we would not know it was there at all. A moment in the darkness, where feverish, luminous action precipitates absence, and in so doing, validates a presence which cannot be seen. The absence implied by whole is also a misnomer. This is a blackness quite unlike the oil-slick vacuum of space which fills the telescope. This is a darkness which hoovers up. It eats planets. It swallows stars by incrementally slurping in their matter, eliciting a flare of light in their wake. It inhales insatiably and in return spews light back at us at seemingly impossible speeds of superluminal motion. This is a weighty hole, a hulking hole a spectacular force of black gravity which holds an enormous quantity of light. When Questlove extended Einstein's beautifully titled theory of quantum entanglement, spooky action at a distance, that is, the phenomena in which two remote objects can be almost inexplicably conjoined, such that they can be moved, altered, affected, without ever physically touching, he knew, as Colossal has taught me, that blackness too exists in a spooky condition. Simultaneously bodily, geological, political, planetary, cosmic, conjoined. Questlove says, Einstein was talking about physics, of course, but to me he's talking about something closer to home. The way that other people affect you, the way that your life is entangled in theirs whether or not there's a clear line of connection. Back in the graveyard, Paul and I quickly find that you have to be careful when moving through the cemetery. In some cases, caskets have been exhumed from these graves and holes remain where liberators have finally made it home to countries of which only dreams existed when they had died. Zimbabwe, Mozambique, South Africa, to name a few. Dreams of those countries exist again today, of governments that assert relations between people and between people and earth beyond the profit motive, and in which black presence and futurity is a project in the making and not in retreat. For those of us concerned with the stuff of the earth, matters of movement and making space, the journey continues. A keen understanding of quantum mechanics should give us pause. While you may not be able to see the enormity of a growing body of light and energy, that does not mean you cannot witness its effects or comprehend the veracity of its presence. Perhaps, through the careful study of the spooky, electric brilliance in the matter and minerals of blackness, remaining attentive to holes, shifting between light, years forward and back, attending to the stuff which bursts forth and the gravity of the emancipatory ideas which draw us closer, we might find the necessary strength to take flight once again.